In this video, I'm going to talk about the three things you can do to dramatically improve the security of a PC. Now, I'm going to focus primarily on Windows. However, much of what I have to say, if not all of it, applies to every different operating system that you can run on a PC, including an Apple PC and if you're running some version of Linux or whatever you've done in terms of extra special software you've added to the system. So please stay tuned for later when I get into the meat of the most important things you can do. So let's get started. Now I'm going to present these three things in the order in which they're easiest to do and you know the least costly as well. However, as I go deeper into the three, there'll be much better choices to choose from that'll dramatically make a difference in terms of their security. So basically, they're going to get better in terms of security, but they're going to get a little bit harder to do and may cost a little bit. The first one is passwords. Number one, does your PC have a password on it when you turn it on? Do you have to log into it? Now, when it comes to passwords, you want to pick a somewhat complex password. What I mean by that is making it eight characters long minimum, and that way you can avoid some of the common crackers that what we call password crackers that could break the password down rather quickly if it's less than that. And you also want to put in special characters and numbers and the letters that you use, you want to use upper and lower case. Sounds kind of complicated, doesn't it? But it doesn't have to be. What you can do is you can pick a phrase, two or three words that you will remember that makes sense to you, but hopefully don't make much sense to somebody else. Oxymorons work very well for that. For example, something like frozen heat or heat frozen. That actually was an old password of mine. And then I separate that with a special character and I would add a third word, which is only about three or four letters, also with another special character that identified the computer it was going to. And I would mix up where it goes in that three word phrase. So something like frozen heat or frozen heat Sam, with Sam being, let's say, the way I refer to a particular computer. A lot of people use names. But in addition to that, you want to make sure that those special characters are things that are not easy to guess. Ampersands tend to be easier to guess. Spaces definitely are easy to guess. But things like an exclamation point, maybe not so much. An open paren, closed paren, again, those get a little bit harder to think about. But you can actually put just about any special character in there. You know, I like colons, semicolons, open parens, closed parens, which really complicate it. In addition to that, to make it even stronger, there are certain letters of the alphabet that look like numbers. They may be mirror images of them, but they look like them. For example, a common one is rather than using the letter E, you use the number three. Okay? And so you substitute the three in for the E. You can also substitute a zero in for the O. Then you can substitute a 1 in for the I or a 1 in for the L or whatever your imagination takes you to. And then you can be consistent with that every time you change your password, which is fine. Because somebody would have to know how you're thinking that through in order to successfully guess that password. So that's the type of thing you can do to actually help you not only remember the password, but make it so strong that nobody will be able to crack it, really. Not in any reasonable amount of time. There is a website you can go to. This particular one is the University of Chicago. And if you go there to this particular link that I'm putting up on the screen, and I'll have it down in my notes as well to this video, you can actually run it, put your password in, but don't put the exact password in. That's never a good idea because if somebody were to have compromised that website or if the website is capturing those passwords, you've given a password away. Now, whether they could latch that onto you or not, that's a whole different story, but why take the chance? But pick something that's similar to it that has the same basic structure to it, the same number of letters, special characters, and so forth. And that way you'll see when you type it into that particular one what the strength of it is. There are other ones out there that will also tell you how difficult it would be for a password cracking program to actually crack that password in terms of hours, days, months, years, centuries, generations, whatever. Okay? Uh, so, you know, I may put a couple more down in the link below. Uh, but I'm not going to go into any detail beyond that. But that's the number one thing. First of all, to use a password, which PCs, as I said earlier, don't necessarily require that you use a password. If it's a PC connected to a server, however, it would require you to do that. And not only that, if you're connected to a server, it would actually enforce the fact that you're following some of those rules. And believe it or not, the administrator of the server can't make them below a certain threshold. So there's a minimum thing that every server out there requires. And this is done by the software manufacturer. 
So just keep that in mind and come up with some decent passwords going forward and that'll dramatically improve the uh, ability for your PC to stay secure, to keep somebody who's unauthorized out of it. If for whatever reason they're able to try to remotely connect to you because you made mistakes in terms of your network or router configuration, they still won't be able to get into your accounts. Now, number two, the second one on the list for improving the security of your PC is, do you know the difference between an admin account and a regular user account? Most people don't, so don't worry about it if you don't understand that. But an admin account is like the super god of that computer. And unfortunately, certain operating systems like Windows, by default, they won't even warn you and they'll let you use an admin account as your normal login and continue to use it. Well, the admin account has too much power for the average user. My PCs, I do not run as admin normally. I'll only go into the admin account in very rare cases where either I tried to do something as a regular user and it needed admin permissions. And in that case, the software, Windows 10, for example, will pop up a thing. It knows who my administrators are. It'll pick the first one in the list alphabetically and it'll say, I got to type in the password for that particular admin in order to proceed with what the software is trying to do. Well, that'll be a big clue, for example, if somebody's trying to penetrate you using malware or virus. Let's say you clicked on a link in your email or you went to a website that was not that secure and it automatically tried to do that. Well, if you were administrator, it would, at least the newer bills of Windows 10, will actually pop something up to verify that that's what you want to allow it to do to modify the system. But if you have the same account, all it'll do is do a pop-up that is waiting for an okay. And you may know how it happens with Windows. Sometimes you lose what we call focus and you're actually in one window when you think you're in another. And if you accidentally hit enter at the wrong instant in time and you were administrator, it will take that as an okay. It'll allow whatever you're doing that you didn't intend to do. And that includes not just malware, but it could be just an accident where you accidentally delete something critical. It allows that to take place. So by having a separate admin and a user account, that's how you resolve that. Now, all you have to do to create a separate account, I'll quickly show you, is go into, there's a couple of avenues to it, but all you really have to go into is the user account part of, let's say, Windows, and the same function exists also with the other operating systems, you know, Apple and Linux and several others, and create a new account. And when you create a new account in Windows 10, the later builds anyway, and definitely it'll happen in Windows 11 as well, it defaults to a regular user account, the new one that you're creating. Now you can override that and make another admin account, but I don't suggest you do that unless you're following my basic principles of setting up a new system, which is to have two admin accounts. For example, my main admin account, which if you watch my videos, you've seen it many times, is David underscore admin, well known. You don't know what my password is though, and you don't know how often I change it. And there's several things you don't know about it, right? That I'm not gonna obviously tell you in this video. But in, in addition to David under admin, I have a David under admin too. And that one has a different password to it. And what that is, is my backup. If for whatever reason, my main admin account gets corrupted, well, I don't want to have to rebuild the entire PC. I have the backup admin account that I could use. Rarely have I had to do it, but I have had to do it. And then all the other accounts in the system, you make regular user accounts. And for example, in my case, the key people in my household, they have an account and they have a, an account with the same name and a number two at the end. So my regular user account is David and my backup to that is David two. And on a periodic basis, I copy over the profiles between those two accounts so that they look pretty much the same to me if I ever had to resort to my, um, my backup account. Now, why do I need that? It's especially important with users. Well, if you make a mistake or a malware or, ant or virus gets into the system, it has direct control over your profile. It can destroy your desktop icons. It can destroy whatever it is that you put on your desktop or that's under your normal environment variables like, you know, my files, my documents, my pictures, anything with the my in front of it. Uh, it will have access to all of that and it could corrupt and destroy all of that. That's what we call the profile by having the backup with a copy of all of that. And I can show you to that in a separate video if enough people are interested in it, how to set that up. Uh, then you always have that one to resort to. But the rest of the PC, the operating system itself, will not be harmed by that. And I've had that happen multiple times in my household, not with me directly, but with mostly other users in my household who've accidentally went to a bad website, 
corrupted their profile, and then I had to have them revert to their secondary login to get back in. So that's the second most important one. And if you do that, believe me, that, and that doesn't cost anything extra, a little more effort, you know, than just having passwords because now everybody has to, you know, remember to click on their account when they go to log in, it'll list the account names. And it's not much effort at all once you get used to it. And it'll vastly protect your PC. Now the third one. A third one will cost you a little bit of money depending on how you want to do it. So what does this look like here? If I hold this up to the camera. Well, if you look at it very carefully, it looks like a little key, except it has actual tracing lands that you would see normally like on a PC board. Well, that's, those are the lands that are inside of a USB stick, but they're exposed here, which is fine because they're, they're protected from damage. Well, this has a keyhole in it as well. And what that allows you to do is put on a keychain. But this key you can use depending on which model you have, and there's several different ones, multiple manufacturers of these types of uh, what we refer to as a security key, it will allow you to protect not only your PC, but it'll allow you to protect all your online accounts because most of the online accounts today will allow you to use a key like this as opposed to another form of what we call two-factor authentication. Now, what does two-factor authentication really mean? It means that you don't just have your password to identify you. You have something else. The password is something that you know, right? Well, a lot of the two factors you may be familiar with, they have you take your phone, your cell phone, and put in the cell phone number to it so that they could either text you or call you, depending on how you've configured it, to verify who you are before they let you into the account. Now, most of the time they don't ask you every time you log in, but they can tell that you're coming from a different computer based upon what we call the IP address of that computer. What network address is it coming from? So in those cases, it will then prompt you to get ready for a code. We're going to text it to you and you'll then have to type it in. And only after you've done that successfully, right? With your cell phone, right? Will it let you actually get into the PC or application in this case, right? Now, there are multiple different ones, as I said, one of the ones that's most popular and Believe me, they're not sponsoring this video. And I wish they were because I like it, but they're not, is this thing called a YubiKey. And there's a lot of different brands of this. Now, the reason I like the YubiKey is it has the most support. And not only the most support for different online applications, but it also has different options to it. This particular one actually is called an NFC, which means that all you have to do is put it near certain devices that are NFC compatible and it actually can communicate with this, and you don't have to do beyond just putting it near. And that works well if you have, let's say, a smartphone and you wanna use this for. This one will work with a smartphone. I could configure it because it is an NFC, and my smartphone is also NFC capable. But if I don't have NFC, for example, my PC itself, and either I'm logging on to a remote application or I'm logging onto the PC itself, which is another advantage of this model, because this company, Yubi Core, they actually have software, which I'll show you on the screen right now, the software that, uh, that you can use for that. I'll put the link down below as well that shows where you can get that software to load it on your PC if you happen to have one of the, at least the level four or level five YubiKeys. It actually changes, as you can see on the screen, what the login looks like. It's not the default Windows login anymore. You actually see sort of a graphic representing the YubiKey. So that sort of is a hint that at least some of the accounts, you don't have to do all the accounts, at least some of the accounts are protected by a YubiKey. And if you do this right, every person has their own YubiKey. And if you really want to do it right and you're really super cautious, everybody has two YubiKeys for every account. Now you can use one YubiKey for multiple computers and multiple accounts on multiple computers. So you're not limited in that in any way. But you, if you lose your YubiKey, right, it would be nice to have a backup. Now, there's other ways around it. I'm not going to go into that here, but I could make a special video talking about all of those alternative things you can do and how to set up the YubiKey for both logging on to your Windows PC or logging on to any of your online applications. If you're interested, just put a comment down below. So this is the strongest way of the three that I'd like to talk about today. Now, there are some more advanced methods that you can use. And uh, I'll just list them in particular here. So they include things like, and this is just a subset of them, 
let's say three-factor authentication. There is three-factor authentication capable devices. A combination, even the YubiKey can be configured to do something that's equivalent to a three-factor. But you can also decide, well, to buy a special YubiKey that takes a fingerprint. So you not only have to either swipe it near the device or plug it into the USB, but it has to scan your finger at the same time. Well, the finger now is a third factor. The fact that you own the key is the second factor, and you still have to put your password in. You can, you can make configure it so you don't have to, but I don't recommend that, right? And the stronger you need that PC to be, the stronger it can be with three factor. Now, you can also make it, and this is particularly helpful with a laptop, so that the hard drive itself is encrypted. So if you were to lose your whole laptop, nobody would be able to get into it unless they have at least a one-factor authentication to, the, to get into it. And the, most of the encrypting software that you have out there, including the free one that comes with Windows called BitLocker, and anybody can turn that on their PC. Again, I can make a separate video showing you how to do that if you're interested. Then if you lose that laptop or somebody gets your PC, lets you have it in an open office somewhere, it's the same thing as it being a laptop, right? Then they will not be able to get to any of the data. They will not be able to then log on to anything. It won't even boot up because the first thing it asks you for is a passphrase for your BitLocker to unencrypt the hard drive. Very nifty. And I can show how that's done in a future video as well. And then another one I'd like to mention is something that I did mention earlier, but I didn't give any detail, is having an authentication server like I have in my network here in my home and home office. The authentication server is the governing body of who can log into what PCs. So that's it.